Let's all stand and turn to 185. Saying glory to his name this morning. Hallelujah. We're in church this morning. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. I'm excited. We're coming on to Easter, a time we remember our Lord and Savior, his death, his, his sacrifice for us, but his resurrection, glorious resurrection from that tomb. How about that? I, this morning, I'm going to tell you that cross this morning, I towed it out there to the cemetery. And it ain't got a bit lighter since the time we carried it out there last time. But I couldn't help but think that thing on my shoulder about how my Savior drug that cross to Calvary, beaten, condemned, and he drug that cross from me to Calvary, for me. And I thanked him this morning, standing out there, I about shed a tear, thanking him for what he did for me. But bless God, he didn't just tote it to Calvary, son. He went to that grave, and God raised him. He was raised from the dead, and he's alive forevermore. Hallelujah. How about that this morning? Listen, in the book of Hebrews this morning, chapter 1 and verse, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are combassed about with so great a, uh, great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, looking into Jesus this morning. He's the author, he's the finisher of our faith, my faith this morning, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God this morning. Praise God, that's where he's at, Chris. Verse 3, for consider him that endured such a contradiction, a contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. In the book of Luke this morning, i got a couple of verses to read there. 
And I've got them right here so I can see them a little bit better, I hope, this morning. Uh, chapter 23 and verse number 39, the Bible says this. And one of the mal malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Doth, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily, I say unto thee, uh, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Praise God. In Romans chapter number 3. Petey, put that one up for me. Romans chapter 3. Verse 24. No, I'll flip to it right quick. Romans 3 and 24, the Bible says, being justified freely by his grace through redemption, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It's said that a bank teller can tell a $100 bill coming through their stack of money just by the feel of it, just by the look of it. You want to know why they can do that? There's many, many things on a $100 bill, which I ain't seen one in a while, but there's many things to tell you it's a counterfeit. But a bank teller knows that because as that goes through, they know because they deal with the real thing on a daily basis. They just know. Well, this morning I bring to you a story of three men. And I, two of these, we don't know where they were born really, probably in Israel. But one, I do know where he was born this morning. He was born in Bethlehem to a virgin. Praise God, and this morning, too, we don't know about the childhood of these two. I'm sure maybe they went to church when they were little. I don't know. Maybe they're just you know, mean. But the point is, I don't know. But I do know a little about the one. And I know that he was doing the things of God as a little child. And I know how God had his hand upon him. And I know how he lived a sinless and perfect life. Chris, he weren't mean like us, I don't believe. Yeah. But I know of three that died on a hill. And it's called Galgotha. I know that one was dying for the sins of the two. And many more. And I know that three were buried in graves. And I know that two of them are still somewhere in a probably a mass grave over close to Galgotha. But I know one this morning where that tomb's empty, Chris. He's not there this morning. I know, I know this morning that there was one dying for sin. And that was our Savior. I know there's one dying from sin, and that's that repentant thief. And I know there's one that was dying in sin. And that's the one that written, except Christ as his Savior. And there was one looking to the one for salvation on that cross. You know the other one was just as close as the other one was? Do you realize that Christ was in the middle? And you had one here, you had one here, and it was just as close. But one could see the real thing. He could see Jesus. And the other looked away, and he died in his sins. You know, Jesus, though, didn't take away that old thief's pain, physical pain, did he? He didn't take him off the cross, did he? So what the others want done, but this and here, he didn't take him off the cross. He didn't have, or didn't prolong his life, did he? He didn't give him silver and gold, did he, Chris? And he sure didn't give him a return to his family and he sure didn't give him a nice place to live. That's a whole lot of what gets preached these days, ain't it? Health and wealth on this earth. But he did take away his eternal pain. And he did take him off that cross with him to glory. And he did give him eternal life, Chris. And not only the gold... The gold meant so little that he got to walk on it that evening. His family then, the reunion of his family, those that know Christ believed in Jesus, he was back with his family and those yet to come, if they know Jesus. And he did give him a heavenly home. And that's a whole lot better than a house stuck up on top of the hill somewhere, I promise you that. And that sweet by and by. I see a deathbed conversion. Well, you can say, okay, I'll live my life. How I'm going to live it. And I'll right there at the last minute. I'm going to come to know Jesus. 
Well, you might and you might not because I only see one in the Scripture. I only see one. And I see a man nailed to cross in the morning that's walking on the streets of gold that afternoon. And I see an enemy of Caesar. But that evening, he's a friend of God. And I see a criminal dying in the morning. But I see a man that has a heavenly home and the title of citizenship in heaven. And I see this morning, listen, I see salvation by grace through faith alone. You can't add nothing to what Jesus Christ has done for us. Nothing. It's him. I want you to look up this morning and see him on that middle cross. I want you to see him. It's him. Nothing else. So much is being, seem to be trying, we're trying to cram onto these things, but it's him. It's always been him. I'm going to read you something right quick. pete has got it typed up. Bruce Fields wrote it, and I thought it was pretty good. This is talking to the thief of the cross. How does the thief of the cross fit your theology? He had no baptism, no communion, no confirmation, no speaking in tongues, no mission trips. He had no volunteerism, no financial gifts, no church clothes, no reciting in his prayer. He couldn't even bend his knees. He was a thief. Jesus did not heal his body. He did not uh, smite his scoffers. No spin for brilliant theologists. No ego or arrogance, no shiny lights, no crafty words, no hazy machine, no donuts or coffee in the lobby. He's just a naked, dying man on the cross. He couldn't fold his hands in prayer. Yet it was this thief who walked into paradise the same hour as Jesus, simply by believing that Jesus is the Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Bruce said the gospel is complex, but that's simple. Praise God this morning. So, this morning, all this took place because of what? A little three-letter word called sin. I don't know, Pete, did you get Spurgeon's quote? Listen to this, sin, a little thing, or is it not poison? Who knows it's deadly? Sin is a little thing. Do not the little foxes fall to grace. Doth not the tiny coral insects build a rock which wrecks a navy? Do not little strokes fail lofty oaks? Will not continual droppings wear away the stone? Sin, a little thing? It girded the Redeemer's head with thorns and pierced his heart. It made him suffer in anguish, bitterness, and woe. So I ask you this morning, is sin a little thing? Sin's a big thing. Three men on a hill called Golgotha. Three men on a cross because of sin, but much different reasons. One looking to Savior, seeking His Savior, and one looking away and died in his sins. And I ask you this morning, which one are you? Which one are you this morning? I'm the one looking to Him. It's who I am this morning. The gospel of Jesus Christ this morning, it ain't changed. It's still good. Any prayer requests this morning? The lesson today, I, I've been reading through uh, the Bible this year, and I've been going pretty slow, trying to really slow down and, and absorb what the, the Word of God has to say. And uh, I've been in Exodus and uh, had some thoughts come across that just really encouraged me uh, about uh, how we can trust in the Lord and, and good reason to trust in the Lord. And one of those is I believe here in the, the first part of Exodus where we see a uh, story about Moses. And, of course, we know who Moses is uh, you know, from, from knowing the story. But I thought it was interesting going back and with that knowledge, looking back at the beginning of the story with Moses and how God was watching over him even from the time he was uh, born. But we see here uh, in Exodus, starting in the very first part of it, first four, first seven verses of Exodus. Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man in his household came with Jacob, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, 
Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Jacob was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. And so, of course, we see that uh, the reason that they're in the land of Egypt was because we know from past that uh, God had ordained a, a famine and he had prepared Joseph and they had all come down to Egypt to, uh, to fulfill a promise that God had made to Abraham uh, earlier on in Genesis chapter 15. So here they are in Egypt and God has blessed them and he still remembers his people. He goes through a genealogy here and, and tells us, you know, he's not forgotten his people and he still knows their names and their houses. And he's led them down into Egypt. But now God has increased them. He has abundantly uh, uh, helped them to, to wax mighty, the Bible says, and he's filled the land with them. So they've been doing well down here in Egypt. But any time that God's people prosper, when God's people are having good success, uh, it gets the attention of other people that we dwell amongst here on the earth. The next uh, verses here says, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and, come to, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom, and Ramses. But, there, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. So we see here how uh, the king arises who doesn't know Joseph. So the last king of Egypt had really had respect to Joseph. He thought a lot of Joseph, and he had seen that Joseph was filled with the Spirit of God, and the, the king that knew Joseph liked Joseph. He liked God's people. He set Joseph over the whole land, and he, he, Egypt prospered because of God's people. Now that God's people are prospering and they're waxing mightier than Egypt, Egypt is not happy about this because a king rises up that doesn't know Joseph, and he turns to hatred. The wicked king hated and feared God's people. He saw that they were mighty. God had made them this way, and God calls them to increase. But the wicked king liked the benefits and blessings of the people of God, but he hated the people of God. He hated their, because ultimately we find out later he hated their God, but he hated them uh, because of it, but he wanted to keep the blessings. But the king had devised a plan to oppress them, and he wanted to stop them from multiplying, and he feared that they would fight against him should it come to war. So he saw that um, there was a diminishing of his power. As the people of God were increasing and increasing, Pharaoh realized that he wasn't going to always be able to control these folks, that he wasn't always going to have the same power that he enjoyed having over the land of Egypt. So that was another reason it was causing fear in Pharaoh as he saw this. But the wicked king afflicted them, and he forced them to build treasure cities for him. But in spite of the oppression of the children of Israel, God still was with his people. And the more they afflicted them, the mightier they became. But we read a place in uh, Genesis 32, 28 that said, And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. I bring this verse up to notice the fact that there were two different people mentioned specifically, two different groups of people, the Egyptians and the Israelites. And the significance, I believe, of the Israelites is that by name, they were God's people. They were the people of Israel, which means prince with God. So we see Jacob was a type of Christ. And the Israelites are a type of those who are in Christ the people of God. But then Genesis 29, or 32, 29, the next verse, Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. 
So we see how Jacob was blessed. Jacob's seed was blessed, and they were uh, given this name by God through their father Jacob, who was named Israel, and so they were truly God's people. The Egyptians were the Egyptians. They're a type of a picture of the people of the world, the devil's children, who are enmity with God's people. They may like the blessings and things that can come from God. They may like the attractive things about God, but they don't like God. Their, their minds are enmity against him. They don't want to submit to him, neither can they. And they hate it when God corrects their wrongs. They also hate the fact that since they're not God and God is God, then they have to submit to him. The, the fleshly mind wants to be its own God. It don't want to listen to God. And therefore it hates God and it hates his people and it hates the things of God. And so we see that playing out in Pharaoh, showing him for who he really is. But uh, verses 13 and 14 say, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. And so I thought about here the Egyptians as they get more angry as they see the affliction plan not working because God's people are still increasing. I thought about what a type and a picture it is of today as people go out and attempt to evangelize. As the people spread the gospel, as people can uh, tell people about sin, as we confront the world and their wrong ideologies, they get angry at the church. They get angry at God's people. And then everything that God's people try to do then becomes serving with rigor. I mean, like, basically they make it harder and harder. The governmental powers of today, the the world of today, the culture of today is making it harder and harder for a Christian to serve and live for God in public, in society, because they hate God and they're going against God and they're not going to make it any easier on God's people. It also said that uh, they, had, they were made bitter by hard bondage and all manner of service in the field. And I thought it was interesting that phrase, all manner of service. I mean, in everything that they did, there was nothing that the children of Israel could do that the Egyptians were not trying to lay stumbling blocks and lay hardships before them. They made them serve with rigor in all fields. But here we see uh, verse uh, 15 and 16. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Sifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. So we see now we have a new plan. We escalate. They can't stop them from uh, uh, doing what they are. They can't ever change the fact that they are the people of God. So here we see the wicked get more angry. We can't stop them. God keeps blessing them and increasing them. And what happens is the king then says, I'll just start killing them. He's sitting, it's, well, what he does, he just starts trying to thin the population. He comes up with a plan, which, you know, today we know this term as abortion. And this was specifically, what he was trying to do here was the after birth abortion, of which some politicians are not even against. And, I mean, just a little side note here, I know one thing, if I'm seeing my character in the scripture, I don't want it to be aligning with a guy like Pharaoh. I mean, you know, that's just, just one assessment there for whosoever will receive that in Washington. But uh, the point is, is that he said, kill the sons. And I thought it was interesting how he wanted the sons killed. He said, let the daughters live. My mind goes back to Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. I think that Pharaoh had some, I don't know if he did it intentionally, or, but I think he realized that there was a male headship that God had ordained. And he was thought, well, if I kill the sons, then I'll save the daughters for myself. And what I see in it is that there's a picture of persecution against the men of God, even when they're just babes in Christ. An attempt by the wicked to rob God of his people. God ordained a method of preaching the gospel 
to bring his people in. If men of God don't preach the gospel, then his won't come in. But the thing is, is that the schemes of the wicked cannot overthrow the plans of God. But he says, let the daughters live. And I see this as just wicked lust playing out. He covets the women. In his wickedness, he wants to, he seeks to abuse the women. And when they have no male headship and no males over them to guide them, then the Egyptians can just absorb them into their culture. They can get rid of those Hebrew men who they hate so much and take their women and use them for their own selves. And so we see the, 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 just the depravity and wickedness of Pharaoh. And we see here in 17, But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have you done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered ere the midwives come in unto them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. So as he increases here, he gets angry and calls the midwives in for question because he's obviously seeing male Hebrews being born and living. And he says, Why is my command not followed? So Pharaoh is flexing his political muscle here and wondering why they think it's okay not to listen to the king. But during his inquest uh, to find out why his wicked decree is not obeyed, he finds out that God has made a distinction between the Hebrew women and the Egyptian women. The midwives here give testimony that they really can't follow the king's order because his order was to kill them on the birth stool. Well, they come back with the testimony that the Hebrew women are lively and they have done delivered their sons ere the midwife even gets there. So what I love about this is you see God taking care of the midwives because they feared him. They didn't fear the king. They feared God. And this king who was wicked and wrathful was not like the good God that we have in heaven. He is merciful on them that fear him. And these, these Hebrew midwives feared God, disobeyed the king in obedience to God, and God took care of them. And God dealt well with the midwives, and he also multiplied his people, and they waxed very mightily. But we see also because they feared him, I love this part too, God is so merciful. I mean, gracious, I mean. God is so gracious that they feared God and did what was right, which is what they ought to have done, the midwives. But God gave them houses. He made them households. God blessed them on top of it. God gave them something on top of it, out of, just out of his, him being gracious to them. And I just, just a, you know, a, a part there to stop and just praise God for his, his wonderful grace. But then verse 22, the wicked scheme thus being confounded by God uh, Pharaoh then seeing that his abortion plot will not stop the people of God through his political order, he goes directly to the people, flexes his power, decreeing that each family destroy their own sons by throwing them in the river. Pharaoh here was uh, now going to just cut out the political system. He wasn't going to go through the midwives and try to be kind of, uh, uh, what's the word, concealed try to be concealed about this anymore. He wasn't even going to try to hide his political motives. Now he's just going straight to the people saying, you kill your sons. And he's making sure that they know that he's ordering it and it's by his word that he wants it done. Kill your sons. But here, it's, I see a, also a picture here how Pharaoh's just, it, it, he's challenging God's people either, you know, honor God or honor the king. They've been put in a situation where now they, they can't remain neutral. There's a decision must be made because Pharaoh's give his charge to all the people. Chapter 2, first four verses. And there went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. 
And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dabbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. So we see here specifically a man of Levi takes a wife of the house of Levi, of which we know in the future this is very significant because this becomes the uh, priesthood, the, the Levites. But she conceives and bears a son, and she saw that he was a goodly child. And so she wouldn't destroy him. She wouldn't listen to the king, but rather she saved him alive. And he says, uh, says you know, then she could no longer hide him. And so she made him an ark. I love that the, the, particularly the, the King James Version translates the word ark. And from what I've understood, it's a word that comes from an Egyptian word, which technically means like coffin or box, basket. But I like how the King James particularly uses the word ark here because I think it helps us understand maybe the mindset of Moses' mother. And, but she dabbed it with slime and with pitch. Now, in Genesis 6.14, God told Noah, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. I, in my thinking, I'm thinking that his mother is, is in a situation where she knows she can't remain neutral. She's in a situation where the king says, destroy your sons, throw them in the river. But I love how the king is once again confounded because I believe his mother remembers about Noah and she's seeking wisdom from God and she makes an ark for her son, thus still following the king's order in technicality by putting her son in the river but putting him there in an ark, trusting him to the sovereignty of God as she lays him in the river in this little ark. I believe she drew her strength and encouragement and her inspiration to do this act from the word of God. Um, you know, our Hebrew author, the one who wrote Hebrews, he says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents, because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So we see the writer of Hebrew attributes this to an act of faith. This was an act of faith in God, and we know Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So then faith is something that must be put in us, not that it's from in us. It comes into us through the word of God. And so I believe she was inspired to in her act of faith by remembering the works of God and the word of God. But she put this child in the ark believing and trusting God with her son. She faced the reality that she must do something. She must choose to obey God or the king. But she submits to the governmental powers, which is a good thing as a citizen because government is supposed to in its right form and use be a terror to the wicked not to the good but this governmental power says to do this so in technical obedience she does put her son in the river but she does so trusting in God drawing wisdom from the word of God and she trusts in God and his sovereignty to deliver her son verse 4 Moses' sister Miriam had got interested in this and I love the picture here too though and I thought what an encouragement for parents today. Miriam, little Miriam here is seeing her mother do something that is really hard but she's doing so by faith, trusting in God and that's going to have an impression on the youngsters when they look up and they see faith lived out in the older ones. Not that somebody just says they have faith and they have no works like James says, you know, one who has, says he has faith but has no works, he's a liar. But those who work by faith, who show their faith by their works, that they really do believe God. 
and that they really do have faith in his word. It has an impact on the next generation. Miriam is interested now, and she goes, and the Bible said that uh, to wit what would be done to him. Miriam wants to see the conclusion of this now. So Miriam's mother lived out faith in God before her daughter's eyes. She witnessed with her actions and showed by her works the faith that she had in God from the word of God. And so we go on to verse 5 here. Uh, and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh, or Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son, and she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. What I love here and we see in these last, this last section we're going to cover today was uh, the ark was successful. Her faith in God did not make her ashamed. She was not let down by God, but she trusted in him. That by faith she knew something about this child. That by faith she trusted him to God. And look at how God confounds the king. The, the whole reason the spirit of wickedness was working in Pharaoh to bring about this persecution of God's people was to prevent God's man from coming. He came anyway in spite of it. Because God's people moved by faith and trusted in their God. And he was not going to let them down. He made a promise to them. And for his own name's sake, he was going to keep his word. And so Moses still comes. And what happens is, in great contrast to the design of Pharaoh, his own daughter draws out Moses and has the authority to command done that a nurse be called from the Hebrews and little Miriam then, following her mother here and, and following along to see what would happen with the story, is in the right place at the right time to go to Pharaoh's daughter. And I just believe in this that, that I mean, I don't know, she's just a little Hebrew child. And I think that the compassion that God stirred in this woman's heart as she saw this little weeping child in this basket gave her a little softness to listen to Miriam because she commanded Miriam then to go and get a Hebrew midwife or to get a Hebrew woman, I mean, to come and take the child and nurse the child. Now look at the graciousness of God on top of this. Not only did the woman get her son back to raise him under the protection of the king this time, but she got him back and Pharaoh paid to raise him. Like it's just so amazing when you look at the sovereignty of God in this situation. The wicked has his schemes and he, he hates God and he designs things against God, but the wicked can never confound God. He is omniscient. He knows all. He knows the end before the beginning started because he's the author. I mean, he's the creator. He, he's outside of time and he's outside of space. He's above all. None can comprehend him. None can grasp him. None can outthink him. None can outwit him. None has power like unto the Lord. And, and it's just amazing to me to watch the sovereignty of God over Moses in this story, and, and to bring us to this point. But we see here Pharaoh's daughter having authority to do so. I mean, it's just amazing. Like, he, how he, the one person, like the one person that could find him that would actually have authority to, to, to make this come about. Like, it's just amazing. God used that. But then, you know, he confounded the wicked schemes once again. He took care of his people who believed in him. But anyway, the last thing here is it's important to note 
that when his mother did this, she wasn't doing it just to get a good thing. One thing to last to denote about his mother when she exercised his faith, she was resolved to God's sovereignty. She wanted the Lord to do what he would do. She wasn't trying to influence him. She wasn't trying to sway God. She was trying to serve God. She was resolved to the fact that if Moses did perish in that river, she had put him in the hands of God in the best way that she knew how, following the faith that she had in God and in his word. But I love how, in the end, a good result came because God ultimately had a plan he was working that wasn't going to be stopped by the powers of wickedness. But that's where I'm going to stop today. I uh, appreciate y'all's attention, and uh, I hope it was a uh, help to you, and hope I was uh, helpful in teaching it and not confusing. But uh, uh, if y'all got any questions or comments, uh, we'll have that now if somebody's got a word on their heart. I'll stand and turn to, uh, let's sing the family of God. the service this morning, a special service, we're having communion service, and I'll try to preach about that, and I was thinking, uh, many of us that had been saved for several years and grew up in church, and uh, after that we'd got saved, and we participated in the communion service, and uh, I've been involved in a lot of them through the years, and it's always a privilege, and one of my points this morning is, I was thinking and I'll just say it now, and then I'll preach it again after a while. Uh, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Uh, that's written on our communion table, in remembrance of me. And I was thinking about Barbara's song, the song uh, that's been some time back uh, for us here one Sunday, on uh, Remind Me, Dear Lord. And the songwriter said, I'm only human, and humans forget. And remind me where you brought me from and where I could have been. And, uh, you know, as humans, the communion service uh, was for, and I may just preach it right now, just stand up a minute, amen, I've, I just, it's burning in my soul. Uh, the communion service, as we are observing it this morning, and as Jesus instituted, he instituted it for imperfect people like you and I. But, you know, one day, uh, praise God, we're going to observe as, as perfect people when we get the new body. And he said, you'll drink it again with me afresh in the kingdom. It's, it's, there's, there's something else out in the future. But this morning, we're privileged to be here at Bethany and, and participate in the communion service. And while I'm saying that, I want to mention two or three other things that's on my mind right now. Uh, let's remember our uh, uh, Saturday, this coming up Saturday, a uh, special time here. Uh, egg hunt and, uh, and a movie and, and lunch and trying to reach out and uh, 
uh, on Saturday, then our Easter sunrise, Easter Sunday. We've got a lot of good things happening, and so let's be praying about that. Uh, this morning, we'll take prayer requests. Maybe there's something to be prayed about. This is the first Sunday this morning, and we're already into the first Sunday of April, and uh, the special time, isn't it? So, uh, Michaela, our children's church, if you'll come. Well, good morning, ladies. How are you? Good? Yeah, goldfish are pretty good, so I'm, I'm glad you're having a good morning. So, let me ask you a question. Do you know what today is? Uh, well, today is Palm Sunday. Have you ever heard of that before? Well, you're about to learn. <laughs> so, first of all, let me ask you a question, okay? Marcus, you too, all right? Okay, I'm here. Okay, you're here. <laughs> so have you ever been really excited about something? Have you ever been excited about a soccer game? Yeah. How about a dance recital? Yeah, have you been ever, ever been excited about that? Yeah. Have you ever been excited? What have you been excited about, Marcus? Something you just can't, con can't contain it. You're so excited. Get my paycheck here. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, so let me tell you, in, in the Bible, okay, there were these people, they were called the Jews. And those, they were. And so the story today is about the Jews, okay? Jesus, he was a Jew, okay? So these are his people, all right? Okay, so he has done all these miracles, Okay, he's healed the blind, he's um, healed the sick. I mean, he has done amazing miracles, okay? And so all these people have heard about it, and they're believing that maybe he is the one that the scriptures are talking about, the one that has prophesied, the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. Okay, so they are so excited because these, these Jews, they have been oppressed, and it's been, it's been a really hard time for them, okay? They're under the Romans, and they're very, very strict, and they're very mean, and it's a dangerous time, okay? So they're about to be delivered. They're about to be saved. They're excited. They're really excited. And so let's see what Scripture says when Jesus, he, start, he um, rides into Jerusalem, okay? Let's see how the people react, okay? All right, so, and it says, And when they drew nigh into Jerusalem, there... And were come to Bethphage unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find a donkey tied, and a colt with her, and loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. And all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, right? He just got a donkey because Scripture, before Jesus was even came, Scripture had told about this. Can you believe that? I know. And so let's go on in the story, okay? And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And brought the donkey and the colt, and put them on their clothes, and put them their clothes, and they set him thereon. Okay, so they finally have the donkey, and he's getting ready to ride into Jerusalem, and so they put a little saddle with clothes on it, okay? So Jesus is riding on the donkey, and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches from trees, and strode them in the way. So here's some little palms. So they put them on the ground like this. They were so excited that they took their own coats off and their own clothes off and even trees, and they put them down so that whenever Jesus went through, he didn't even touch the ground. That's amazing. And the multitudes went before, and they followed, cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. This is the one that has done all these miracles. This is the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. 
And so you know what happened, though, whenever he was going through the town? People were rejoicing and, and so excited. They've been waiting for this. But there are these people called the Pharisees. And in Luke, it says, uh, the people, they're still talking, they're saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And you know what the Pharisees say? They say, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. Tell them to calm down. Tell them to be quiet about this. But what does Jesus say? Jesus says, and he answered unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Right? There was so much joy because what Jesus was getting ready to do for not just the Jews, but for all of us, you, me, your dad, your mom, everybody, this marks the beginning of the journey to the cross. It does. And so Jesus, he even, scripture even tells us that Jesus, there was joy in this for him to go towards that cross. Yeah, so as we go throughout this week, let's remember this journey that he takes for us and the sacrifice that he made for us. Okay? Okay? And what he did on that cross changed everything. We talked a little bit earlier this morning about how sin is so ugly and so powerful and we're all underneath sin, okay? We can't do anything our, on our own to get rid of this sin, right? But Jesus came and Jesus made a way for us to be able to get rid of our sin. We believe in him and believe what he did. Because he didn't stay on the cross. You see up there? See, there's a cross up there, but there's nobody on it. Right? He didn't stay there, and he didn't stay buried when they put him in the tomb after he died. He didn't stay there either. He arose, and we get to talk about that next week, so I won't spoil it too much, but it's very, it's even more exciting than this. So let's just say our memory verse, okay, just so we can kind of remember this. You ready? Do you remember the memory verse we've been doing? John 3, 16. Do you ready to say it together? All right, church, are you ready to say it together? <laughs> For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, that's why Jesus came and did what he did. So just remember that as you keep going throughout this week, okay? And then when Easter gets here, boy, we are going to talk about the really exciting stuff. Okay? So does anybody have any prayer requests? Children's Church. Bible School. Bible School, thank you. <laughs> All right, let's pray for our preacher, okay, in this communion service that we're about to have. Okay? All right, so let's pray. I'll stand and turn to 112.
this morning, and we're looking, and uh, I believe uh, it's Timothy back there, and I'm sorry I did not write down on my notes. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verse 23 through verse 29. So he can find that this morning. I forgot to write it on top of my outline uh, that I'd given to him. Uh, but we appreciate you being here this morning. This is a very special service, and uh, we just thank the Lord for it. And I was thinking, and uh, through the years I've observed this, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, everybody enjoys seeing the preacher mess up. Amen. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what kind of feels said, well, he's just where we are. Well, you can rest assured I'll be messing up more than any of you. So uh, we're looking in 1 Corinthians. As I said, I forgot to put it on uh, my outline that I give to, to uh, our technicians back there. And in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll look at some verses there. And the Lord, after supper being ended, the Bible says in the book of Matthew that he... Uh, gave the bread and, and the cup and he instituted the Lord's Supper. And then Paul, I believe, gives us uh, something here in 1 Corinthians as we look and he uh, gives us some important things about the communion service. And I'll look at that. That's what my message is this morning. And I have about six thoughts about the communion service. And I was thinking that uh, in being in church sometime, and, uh, or I say as, as many of us have had the privilege, then uh, we might just assume that everybody just understands fully. But uh, I trust the Lord to help me this morning to share on my heart as I begin studying about the communion service. And you say, well, why do you need to study again about the communion service that you've been through many of them uh, through the years? And so I have. But one of the things that stood out that I've already mentioned about that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And I, I was thinking and I was studying that uh, each of us as Christians, we need to be reminded again and again. And uh, so that's part of the, the instructions that the Lord give. And then I might say this, the communion service, and that's one of my points this morning, is what a privilege it is. And it's for those that are saved and uh, that, that we have this wonderful privilege this morning. So we'll begin reading in, in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 23. And it said, Therefore I have received uh, of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and he said, Take eat. Uh, this is my body which is broken for you, uh, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, uh, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, and this do you as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Uh, for as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death uh, till he come. And wherefore, whosoever eateth this bread... And drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning of the Lord's body. Our Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, thank you this morning that we can come and meet here for this special service. And I thank you for those that have prepared and got things ready for those that will serve. And Lord, I pray you'd help us. We pray for the prayer requests been mentioned in our opening and then again in our service, the needs that are there. And we pray especially, Lord, you'd move and help in all those needs. I pray especially for Brother Adam and the mission trip, Brother Obed, and that there may be many souls, one to the Lord. It'd be a fruitful trip. You'd bless with safety and with power, and with moving. And I pray that in this service this morning, if there's someone that's not saved, may they be saved for Christ's sake. And I pray, Lord, you'd help me just lay aside all the things that would hinder. You would just be with me. I pray you'd move back the forces of evil and give me liberty, Lord, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. 
And I pray you'd touch me and help me to bring forth that that you'd be pleased with. In Jesus' name, amen. Now I want to look this morning, and I'm depending on you, uh, Timothy. If I don't even have my notebook up here this morning with me, but we'll just go from uh, and, and what's on my heart uh, that the Lord laid on my heart about the communion service. And I couldn't extra, uh, stress uh, too greatly, I don't think, the importance. And as I said, I remember all through the years and growing up that uh, in our church, it was each and every time uh, such a, a serious and solemn and sincere service that we came to it uh, with uh, understanding, as the Bible talks about, discerning the Lord's body. Now, there are some misconceptions and very grossly misconceptions of the communion service. And it's, uh, I can't remember, it's a big word, but you can look it up. The Catholic Church actually believes in taking the communion service that the bread becomes the body of Jesus and that the, the, the cup uh, becomes the blood of Jesus. That's uh, such a gross uh, uh, false doctrine. And there are others that participate in different things and then there are those that believe, and I believe this morning, uh, that it is a symbol. I believe that. But some reduce it to a symbol and they stop there. But I say this morning that it is a symbol, as Jesus said, that this blood, and I, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the bread symbolizes body. And so the cup symbolizes blood. We believe that. But I believe that it's a step further than that, that not only is it a symbol, but thank God this morning it's a reality in our hearts. And that reality is that we're discerning the Lord's body. And I'm going to try to preach a little about that. We understand and we come with thanksgiving and gratitude in our heart and with a humble confession that we know and understand, praise God, through the salvation of the Lord Jesus, what it really means and what it really means to you and I and how precious it is. Our memory verses in the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, we've got two together. It said, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, and it's the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself his life a ransom for all, that he might be testified in due time. And I'm glad that he did that, aren't you, that he gave his life a ransom for all. That's exciting to me that God does not want to leave anyone out. You think about that. Should he want to leave anyone out, maybe you might be the one that was left out. But I'm glad he didn't, aren't you? And that our verse, our memory verse, John 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him. We used to sing a song to kids. I remember years ago we taught the kids a little song about whosoever, and they would sing, and they said, whosoever surely meaneth me. And each one of us can take that to heart personally, whosoever meaneth me. And it meaneth each one that'll come to the Lord Jesus and believe in him. And I believe that. Man comes, the salvation plan is presented uh, by the grace of God, appears to all men, and people do one of two things. They either respond or they reject the salvation plan. I pray this morning that if you've never responded and receives that, that this morning would be the morning. Now I'll look this morning, just six things that I want to mention as thinking about the communion service. And we see this, and I believe this. Paul said, this I have received of the Lord. Uh, number one, it is a divine command. Now you know, I, through the years, and there's been good people, I mean Christian people, I remember one particular lady in our church and such a, and she was an outstanding Christian in my mind and I believe she was. But she for many years, and she testified to that herself, did not have a, 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 an understanding, I might say, of the communion service. And she exempted herself from participating in the communion service. And she did that with her own thinking of that she was unworthy. She misunderstood the, the, the word, the, the meaning of where it said, if you unworthily not discerning the Lord's body. And she exempted herself. But I believe for every Christian 
that it is a divine command, number one. And it, not only that, but praise God, it's a blessed privilege, amen, to participate in the communion service. But I might say this within our verses that we read this morning, and that was my last point that I didn't include in my outline, was that there is a solemn warning, and we see that in the verses. And in one of the verses that we read this morning, it said, let a person examine himself. We used to in our services, perhaps we might, and I'll just impress this now, uh, I'm, in growing up, our, our pastors that we had through the years would have, would have just sometimes a moment of quietness uh, where that each one of us could reflect in our hearts and examine our hearts and that we could confess if there was needful for confession of sin and ask the Lord to forgive us. And I might inject this again as I've already said and you say, well, you're excusing sin. If you've done said we need to examine ourselves and repent, no, indeed I am not. But I know in my own heart this morning that we still have the sinful nature and each one of us that are participating in the communion service this morning, we're participating as an imperfect person. And it's not a perfect one here, but thank God when we drink it anew in his kingdom, praise God, we're going to drink it in the aspect then that we will be perfected and we'll be, have that glorified body just like him, praise God. And the communion service and that's one of my things in my notes there. The communion service will be supplanted by the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll no longer, whenever we're there with him, we drink it this morning, and the, the Lord's Supper looks backward to the cross and forward to the crown, and the, and the Lord's Supper gives strength and encouragement to the believer. And that's what it will do for us. One of the things, the benefits that we will experience this morning and then the supper will be supplanted by the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll no longer participate as we are this morning until we, uh, uh, while we're waiting till he comes, praise God. And when he comes, it changes things, amen. But for now this morning, we're back to my outline. Number one, it's a command. And then number two, what a great privilege it is. A privilege this morning that we're doing this in remembrance of him. And then not only is that, it's a necessary memorial. And I've already mentioned that. I mentioned about Barbara singing the song, uh, Remind Me, Dear Lord. And the songwriter said, We're only human and humans forget. Forget. And how we need to be reminded. And what a reminder this is to my heart and to your heart this morning of what Jesus did for us. And we'd all admit, I believe, we'd be honest, sometimes in the course of life, in the, in the busyness of life sometimes, uh, we're kind of forgetful. And we, we say this sometimes, that many times we take a lot of things for granted. So we're reminded this morning, and it's a freshness in my heart, and the preacher's already shared a little preacher, Chris, something the Lord's laid on his heart, and he excited me back there, shared it to me back in the back just a minute ago, a few minutes ago, and thank God this morning for the communion service, and it is a necessary memorial, and we're keeping it this morning, and then it's a willing testimony. As we partake this morning in the communion service, we're giving forth a testimony that we believe, thank God, that the cross of Calvary and when Jesus went there and in his own body bore our sins in his own body on the tree and that his body, the symbol of the bread of his body, he says in our verses that was broken for you and I. And he did that for each one of us this morning. Not only a willing testimony, praise God, we testify to the cup which was symbolic of the New Testament of his blood. And it's through and by his blood this morning. And thank God it's still the blood that cleanses from sin. And it's still the blood that washes, praise God, and cleanses you and I. And what can wash away my sins? I've heard that ever since I was knee high to a duck as we sung it in the years through the church. Over and over again we'd sing what? can wash away my sins. And the songwriter said nothing but the blood of Jesus. When we're partaking this morning, you and I are giving, praise God, a willing testimony that that's exactly what we believe and that what God has done for us and has washed our sins away. We're testifying of that through taking part in the communion service. Amen. And then not only is that, but thank God it's a humbling confession. 
And you say, what's that, preacher? I'm coming this morning to the communion service and I'm confessing to the Lord himself and each one that would understand this morning that we're all sinners and but for the body of the Lord Jesus that he bore my sins in on the tree and the blood, thank God, that he shed for me that I, without that I'd have no hope and I'd be lost for all eternity. But thank God he did that for you and for me this morning. I, it's a humbling confession. Just a sinner, unworthy, undeserving. Nothing on my part. In fact, my part, I was the one that, like a sheep that went astray and turned to my own way. But thank God, God laid on him my iniquity, your iniquity, and the iniquity of us all. And he bore us there and shed his blood that was, a, was an accepted sacrifice to God the Father, amen. He, he appeared in the presence of God for you and I with the blood that was sufficient, the sacrifice, the price that he paid, that he bought and paid for my sins, just a sinner, saved by grace, amen. amen. Be good, we'll never forget that. I want to just inject this here, and I say it, I'm speaking to myself, sometimes as a Christian, and maybe you've been saved a lot of years, and we look at maybe somebody else on, and we begin to pass our opinion and sometimes our judgment and whatever. But we're all sinners. And there's a danger, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a danger as a Christian as we've been saved for years and maybe we think we, and maybe we have reached some uh, 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 mark of maturity. But we need to be careful that we not get in a self-righteous attitude. And it's all through by His grace that we're here this morning and that we're saved only by and through His grace. And I'm reminded of that this morning and I'll make a humble confession. I'm glad that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, aren't you? We used to have a fellow in our church He's been in heaven now for, I guess, a year and a half. And his life was involved with drinking. He was very deeply involved in drinking. He went beyond an alcoholic. He was a drunk. In fact, he told me that he would keep beer under his bed at night. In fact, he said, if I wake up during the night, I just reach under the bed and I can get a kick, he said, out of a hot beer more than I could have cold. And that was his life. But there's a preacher went by one day and left him a gospel track. <laughs> and the day the preacher went by, he was sitting there at the table drinking a beer, and the preacher went in, spoke to him, talked to him some, and left him this gospel track. He said after the preacher left, he got that, that track and he read it. And I believe he said he read it again and seemed like he read it for at least three times. But he said he took it to his bedroom, that track with him. And I believe he read it again there, but he got down on his knees by himself there in his bedroom and he asked God to save him. Brother Wayne was his name. And he had the most unusual singing voice. Loretta, I've heard he could sing bass and then he could sing a high tenor. He, he, had some, he had some distance in his voice. But he'd get to singing, and he used to sing, and I can hear it now in my mind, I'm so glad that God saved old sinners. And the songwriter wrote in that song, and it said the biggest surprise in God saving old sinners is that he would save an old sinner like me. And then the communion service this morning is an act of faith. Jesus said we're looking back at his death. We used to sing a song in our church, I remember dark Calvary. 
do us all good to go back and remember Calvary. We're doing that this morning in the communion service. But then he said this, remember his death until he comes. As we participate this morning in the communion service, it's an act of faith. You say, what's the act of faith? Praise God, I'm saying this morning by participating that I believe he's coming back. And he ain't come back yet. And there are those scoffers that says, where's the promise of his coming? And I've heard that for a long time and reckon he's still coming. But as I'm participating this morning, praise God, I'm saying and you're saying, praise God, I believe he's coming. And it is indeed an act of faith. And I'm so excited to participate in it. And I trust you all as likewise in the communion service. As I've said many times, I've had commun- and participated in communion service. But I want to thank God this morning that it ain't lost a bit of its edge of its freshness and its excitement and the dearness that it is to my heart. I heard an old preacher said that he had preached 700 times at least through the years on the second coming of Jesus. And he'd traveled all over the country and he'd preached that message over and over again. But he said, you know, that God has a way of quickening time. And I heard him preach it in White Plains close to Mount Airy. And he was preaching once again after hundreds of times. He's preaching on the second coming of Jesus. And he's up in his 80s then. And he got so excited that night. And he said, it's fresher and it's more real to me tonight than it's ever been. It is with me this morning. Thank God. It's fresher and it's more real to me, thank God, than it's ever been. And I say glory to God. Glory to His name. We won't have just and I think this is a good tradition. And as I said, the older preachers that I was under, that, I, that pastored our churches through the years, they had passed this down. And we're going to have just a moment of silence with our heads bowed and eyes closed. And whatever that we need to do, if we, if we need to do, then it'd be good we just examine ourselves and we're coming before the Lord. And I am myself this morning. And the psalmist said it this way, search me and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. And I'd ask the Lord to forgive me. I want to thank you for salvation and thank you for saving me. And already this morning as I awoke and began to think, as my mind went back in the past, I began to think, reflect, And I pray you'd help me as I've come this morning that this would indeed be for me a freshness and a reality of experience that I can say to God be the glory. And I'd ask you, Lord, to forgive me of sin. Maybe we're conscious of and maybe our neglect, our failures, our faults. I pray you'd help me, and I want to come to the communion table this morning in your sight, coming and realizing that it's only through and by the grace of God, and Lord, through your mercy, and it's not by works of righteousness which I've done, 
but according to His mercy, you save me. And thank God near the cross, as Fanny Crosby worded it, near the cross a trembling soul, thank God love and mercy found me. And there the bright morning star shed its beams around me. And Lord, I rejoice in that. And I come humbly before you. I pray you'd cleanse me. You'd help me. I want to come discerning the Lord's body. I want to be reminded again in my heart, in my soul, my mind, as I concentrate and focus on you in remembrance of you. Thank you for what you did for me on Calvary. Lord, I'd be lost and on my way to hell if it not be for the grace of God. And I thank you for a home you're preparing and the promise of heaven. And I rejoice in that. And I rejoice this morning that you're coming again. And as I've prayed this week for myself, I pray again. Help me, Lord, to love your appearing. Pray you'd help us. And help us as we go further. The communion service, preacher Chris and myself, and the deacons that'll serve, and each one that participating. May this be something special as it is, as you've taught us, in Jesus' name, amen. missed.